interactive Q&A to follow. Also, they will be signing and selling books right outside the theater afterwards. So please pick up a copy of the book and join me in giving a warm welcome to John David. Okay. So what we thought we'd do is, uh, I'll do a reading. Mostly we want to talk about the current situation of opioids in the country, in the world. Uh, we're going to cover a little history first, talk about that. But uh, I hope what we can bring, there's a lot of discussions in the area, and I hope what John and I can bring to the equation is, I know a lot of historical background now. John knows and has taught me a lot about the science and the medical stuff and the treatments available. So. I guess the way I look at it is it's a chance to add to the knowledge base of this community to get some of the stuff out there. So that's the plan. So we'll do a lot of talk. It's a good sized group. You can pretty much interrupt when you want, unless we wave our hands. So we've got to move on, because there's a lot we could cover. Um, I'm going to start with a short reading from a chapter called Generosity and Greed. Uh, as we studied the history of opium, we got to the point where I wanted to end every chapter Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Because so much, we've seen so much of this before. Uh, even to do a quick history, you know, there are papyruses with recipe, uh, uh, pr uh, prescriptions with uh, formulas for uh, crying babies that have opium in it. Uh, Alexander the Great did his conquest, got injured seven times, did his conquest through the opium areas. Uh, and they still want to argue whether he did opium or not, but it was like aspirin back then, it was nothing. So undoubtedly he did it, he was also a student of Aristotle who knew all about opium. Around um, the first century, I guess, uh, AD, if you know Marcus Aurelius, the famous Stoic poet, uh, Stoic and uh, Roman emperor, he was essentially addicted to opium and one of the most famous doctors in history, a guy named Galen, Kept him on a maintenance dose. Uh, John knows more about this. The Eleusinini, and I always add a syllable. Or Eleusia. Eleusia, okay, yeah. mysteries. They were using, if you go into the, where the mystery rites were, where the rites were, there, there are statu statues with poppy heads coming out of them, you know, goddesses. So we're pretty sure it was used that way then. Uh, I think one of the more interesting things is getting closer to now is Moses Maimonides, pretty famous Jewish philosopher. Uh, he said, he was in Egypt at the time, physician to Saladin, who was a famous emperor there. He said it's a sin not to provide opium to someone dying, whether they can afford it or not. Palliative medicine, this is what, 1,000 or something. Avicenna, or Jaina, uh, who was a famous Persian philosopher, uh, doctor, who uh, died an addict, uh, died of an overdose, but not before he tried to figure out how to make a replicable dose of opium when you're growing in so many different fields and you're processing it so many different ways. He was very concerned about people's tolerance. He was very concerned about adulteration, you know, a thousand years ago. Uh, in the 1800s, uh, you, there's a book called Green Mountain Opium Eaters. It's about the, the uh, crisis of opium addiction in Vermont in the 1800s, right? Uh, that's another thing that's repeating, unfortunately. In 1806 like, or something, uh, this guy figured out how to isolate morphine from opium because he thought it would be less addictive. In around 1850, a couple guys came up with uh, hypodermic needles because they figured it'll bypass the stomach so it won't be as addictive. Uh, more people know about heroin, which was the Bayer of its time that was developed, so it would be less addictive. And uh, those are the stories that go on and on and on, and yet I thought I'd do this. In around 1900 sometime, there's a famous doctor named William Osler who helped found Johns Hopkins, and he called opium God's own medicine, okay? So, because it was, it was the best painkiller in history for a long, long time. And this, around the same time, I think I'll tell you up front, in 1928, almost 100 years ago, this is a quote of a study on drugs in America. It says, the problem of chronic opium intoxication is so extremely complex and far-reaching, so intimately interwoven with public health, commerce, and trade, and social customs, and has evolved so insidiously that we, we may well ask if the use of opium ever was confined to its sole valuable function, 
namely that of a therapeutic agent. Among the Western nations, the United States seems to have acquired the reputation of being more widely and harmfully affected than any other. Isn't that amazing, 1928. So a lot's changed. Um, so this is from a chapter called Generosity and Greed, which takes place in the 1800s. I'm gonna get my water. I'm gonna drop my glasses. Have you noticed the glasses don't stay on the way they used to? <clears throat> Two centuries before the Sackler family started endowing nonprofit institutions by using profits from Purdue Pharma's aggressive and deceptive marketing of the addictive pre prescription painkiller OxyContin, distinguished families in Boston were using opium profits to do much the same thing. Among the famous institutions that benefited from the opium trade is Boston's Museum of Fine Arts. Buried in its vaults is a 19th century oil painting by an unknown artist entitled Hongs at Canton, China. Its romantic sanitized version of Canton Harbor is the perfect example of the 19th century self-mythologizing that obscures America's complicity in the Chinese opium trade. It shows a row of buildings that look like Washington, D.C. embassies sitting above docks with small sections of browning lawn sloping down from them to the water. To the left and perpendicular, rows of identical warehouses move up the canvas. They look like tobacco barns, although in this case you can almost smell the opium. The water itself is an emerald green reminiscent of the Caribbean or deep limestone pools. A few dozen oared boats crowd around the docks. While out in the water, there are several one- and two-masted ships, two with sails furled, as well as a few other junks in a houseboat. In defiance of the conventions of the perspective, the boats in the foreground are smaller than the same size ones in back, insistently drawing the viewer's eyes to the six flags beyond the harbor itself, which fly on high poles next to the embassy-like buildings. Denmark, Spain, the United States, Sweden, Great Britain, and the Netherlands. Five of the flags represent companies that, like the British East India Company, were monopolies, their rights to trade owned or at least granted by their governments. The United States flag, however, represents a half dozen independent American trading companies that share the headquarters. The buildings and warehouses look fairly new. They were, in fact, built by the Hong merchants of Canton who rented them out to their foreign trading companies. While the American companies were competitors with each other, they were for the most part friendly ones. In the best of times, they cooperated, sharing storage facilities, lending and borrowing money, and entertaining themselves as best they could. But during the week, they could be ruthless competitors. Regardless, almost all would make a lot of money. Some of that money would help fund the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, home of the deceptively romantic painting, Hongs at Canton, China. Another venerable inst American institution that benefited from Boston's involvement in the opium trade is Mass General Hospital. Just down Huntington Avenue from the Museum of Fine Arts, the hospital has to deal with the opioid epidemic on a daily basis. Its Center for Addiction Medicine provides treatment, research, and education in a multidisciplinary outpatient setting. While many emergency rooms are only equipped to revive addicts who have overdosed, at Mass General's ER, anyone suffering from an addiction, whether in crisis or not, can receive immediate medication-assisted medication treatment for their illness, just as they would if they'd arrived with a fractured bone, shortness of breath, or inexplicable sharp pain. That's one of the things that's finally starting to uh, be adopted by more hospitals. While the hospital was incorporated in 1811, construction didn't begin until 1818. Donations ranged from 25 cents to $20,000 with a 273-pound sow of indeterminate value in between. Several of the $20,000 gifts came from respected Boston Brahmins who were busily making that money and more selling opium in China. In addition, McLean Hospital, one of John's former employers, right? One of the earliest and foremost psychiatric centers in the country owes its 300-acre facility in Belmont, Massachusetts, in part to drug money. In the 1950s and 60s, several famous writers with drug problems spent time there, including Sylvia Pat, Plath, I'm sorry, author of the seminal Bell Jar, which is a thinly veiled description of her time as a patient at McLean. The poet Anne Sexton was also a patient at McLean and would, like Plath, commit suicide. Her poem, The Addict, 
is a tragically revealing look at the experience of mental illness, drug addiction, and suicide ideation. While at McLean, Sexton taught her fellow inpatients a poetry seminar. Among the student patients was a young man named Robert Perkins. His great-great-great-grandfather was a philanthropist, Thomas Handeset Perkins, one of McLean's founders and the most successful and unrepentant drug dealer in Boston High Society during the 1800s. Perkins had been chomping at the bit to get in on the opium action since he first heard about merchants in Philadelphia and Baltimore who had made fortunes selling the high-grade Turkish variety. Perkins was ideally positioned to do the same. He had family members in Smyrna, on the Greek coast across from Turkey, who could provide him with inside information on the supply side so he could accurately forecast price fluctuations. Plus his nephew, John Perkins Cushing, was already in Canton, handling their existing non-opium trade, which involved perfectly innocent loads of cheese, lard, and iron, which they traded for equally legal loads of tea and silk. With his experience and resources, it didn't take long for him and his extended family to emerge as the dominant American merchants. In addition to their global connections, the Perkins family had the money, nerve, patience, and strategic insight to survive the cycles of boom and bust in the market for Turkish opium, some of which they even caused intentionally. Even the War of 1812 didn't phase them. One time during that war, a Perkins ship captured two East India Company ships and stole all their gold and silver, proving that they were more than willing and able to blur the line between profiteering, piracy, and patriotism. Just to give you a quick background, because it gets confusing. Turkey was growing opium. It was being sold all over the world. Most of American opium came from Turkey. Meanwhile, the British were forcing their way into India, and, in the two, and particularly the two main opium growing regions uh, in more northern India. And they started cultivating huge amounts of opium. All they needed was uh, people to buy it. Uh, fortunately, back in the 1600s, some Portuguese sailors had discovered uh, tobacco in America. And they seemed to travel all around the world. And pretty soon, they found opium. And they put it in their pipes. And they found it was a good way to smoke opium. And they brought that to China. That worked out well for the British because they had a lot of opium to sell. The British, uh, the uh, Chinese had a lot of tea, a lot of tea. The British needed the tea. The balance of trade would have been very bad if the Brits couldn't have sold their opium to ch the Chinese. So despite the Chinese emperors trying to cut out addiction in their country, the British couldn't afford to have uh, uh, that addiction stop. So that's, that's several chapters of the book. It's very complicated, but our basic assumption that the Chinese were, quote, the bad guys in the Opium Wars just is wrong. It's the opposite. Um, where are we? Eventually, the Perkins Company had 200 vessels carrying opium, again, from, from Turkey, uh, to compete with the British, who were bringing it from India, uh, tea, along with tea, silk, spices, porcelain, and other goods, to and from ports in the Far East, as well as back and forth to America. Somehow, Thomas Perkins found a way in an era before even the telegraph was invented, to manage this astonishingly complicated system from thousands of miles away, setting limits on prices and volume for his buyers in Turkey, determining the best time for his agents in Canton to sell the latest shipment, and perhaps even conducting a form of industrial espionage to gather information about his competitors. During the first few decades of the 1800s, Perkins' business evolved and expanded thanks to marriages and strategic alignments until he could boast the greatest resources, best commercial intelligence, most reliable ships, and most savvy financial strategists in Boston, London, Smyrna, and Canton. Since members of the Perkins family never married below their station and had no station to marry above, over the next few generations, many of the most famous names in Boston society would be swept into their worlds of wealth, generosity, and questionable morals. There's no need to parse excuse me, the dizzying network of connections that was their family tree, loosely, loosely known as the Boston Concern, except to recognize that they owed much of their financial success to the opium trade through this, to the dismay of some of their children and virtually all of their descendants. So if you have a Bryant, Payne, Higginson, Wilcock, Willingses, Latimer, or some other names in your family tree, maybe you got some of that money too. Um, 
There is one player who deserves special mention, Warren Delano II, some of whose money would end up in the accounts of one of America's most famous presidents. Born in 1809, he began working in the trade in Boston as soon as he was old enough to make money. While not a blood relative of the Perkins, he was a contemporary of Robert Bennett Ben Forbes, who was a blood relative. Together, they became junior partners in a company called Russell Sturgis & Company, which through a series of mergers, buyouts, and family agreements, ultimately became Russell & Company, which by 1840 was still managed in the opium trade and doing so on behalf of the Perkins. And it was the largest American firm in China, in the China trade. Now Delano, having made $200,000, which is twice what the family considered you needed to prove a, quote, competence, unquote, a phrase I love, Delano retired and returned at 31 to live in the manner to which he was born to be accustomed. When his fortune took a beating in the panic of 1857, he went back to China to see if his luck and skill still held. They did. Boosted by the rising price of opium that resulted from the huge demand to treat wounded soldiers during and after the Civil War, which is also a fascinating story. In fact, the guy that invented Coca-Cola, excuse me, Coca-Cola, invented it to try to use cocaine to get over his opium addiction. Uh, anyway, there's a huge demand after the Civil War. D Delano died a wealthy man again, but not before marrying Catherine Robbins Lyman, who begat Sarah, begat Sarah Ann Delano, who begat Franklin Delano Roosevelt. One reason that the Americans, such as Perkins, Cushing, and Delano, were able to avoid prosecution, especially after the first opium war, regardless of how questionable their business practices were, was that the only laws that American merchants broke were ones made in China. However, one of the treaties they made, called the Treaty of Nanking, during one of those opium wars that you know, Great Britain just uh, convinced China, had to get uh, got China to agree to almost anything to get them out of there. There were provisions in that treaty that any American merchant or associate accused of breaking a Chinese law would have to be prosecuted by Americans. And since America didn't yet have any laws about trading the drug, they essentially couldn't be prosecuted at all. As far as any moral or ethical issues, or laws, the upstanding church-going Perkinses were aware or cared they were breaking, they undoubtedly justified them based on reports that in China, opium was no better or worse than alcohol. It was certainly better than the slave trade Perkins had profited from early in his career. At the end of his life, Thomas Perkins was eulogized as, quote, one of the noblest specimens of humanity to which our city has ever given birth. By the end of his life, John Perkins Cushing had founded the city of Belmont and was known as the most generous man in Boston. By the end of his life, Warren Delano II had a 16-year-old grandson who would become president of the United States. And by the end of her life, their contemporary, the legendary Empress Dowager, and I can't say it right, C-I-X-I, C-C-I, who is considered one of the most powerful women. How do you say it? C-I-X-I, I thought someone was correcting me. Uh, one of the most powerful women in Chinese history, was a contemporary of them, quote, was a regular evening smoker who advocated moderate use by retirees. In the end, the China trade and the wars that resulted from it is a cautionary tale about drugs, money, power, and greed, and the hypocrisy that inevitably hovers in the territory in between. Sound familiar? So, um, I want to... Uh, move on to the main part of, of this. And I want to read you as sort of an inspiration to this. I had the fortune, or I was lucky to interview Nora Balka, who's the head of the um, National Institute of Drug Abuse in Washington. Uh, she's quite a character. But anyway, sometime during the interview, she said this to me. She said, I don't know why, but everyone goes to this discourse. Is addiction a brain disease or not? And they, every single time there's this panel, they've offered that, this particular question. They think it's actually intellectually interesting in questioning whether addiction is a disease of the brain or not. And it only ends up by being a discussion on rhetoric, because what is ultimately a disease? So this is why I basically said at one point, guys, I mean, what we want to do ultimately is not say who won the argument of addiction is a disease of the brain or not. What we want to do is come up with interventions to help people that are addicted to drugs, with interventions that help people that are vulnerable to being addicted to them. So, yes. Yes. yes, isn't that amazing? Yes. <laughs> so that's what I thought we could talk about tonight. Uh, and I thought we could start by John maybe explaining a little bit of the uh, science of uh, drugs, addiction, opioids, and so on. And does he need his mic? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah. 
I thought so. But I think a mic is good. Was that Wendy? One vote. Th then you have to do it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, everybody gets pain. And what do you do with pain? You either let, you suffer under it, or you can take something for it, right? So if you take a substance that actually ameliorates your pain, um, that's a pretty powerful medicine. So opiates target opiate receptors in your brain that control the processing of pain in the final common pathway. And then by taking this exogenous substance, these, these medicines, because anything can be used or abused, the very thing that treats your pain can take over the very system in your brain that regulates your awareness of pain. So whether you feel, so uh, a little allopathic medicine has its wish to say that medicines only are effective to treat the disease. And then of that model's limitation is then, gee, if you're not in pain, why would an anti-pain medication do anything? Well, it does. You can feel pleasure, you can feel more security, people will describe a warm and fuzzy feeling, and it helps a person feel safe. And of course, it does take away pain. And then there's people who are afraid of pain coming back, so why don't you just take on something to prevent it from even starting? And most people then who wind up having problems with opiates, it's not with the intention to become a drug addict, right? Nobody growing up typically says, you know, one day I want to become an alcoholic. One day I want to become a heroin addict. It's, it doesn't happen like that usually. So um, it may have the most legitimate of origins, but then it co-ops the person and they wind up needing medication for not for pain, but to avoid the symptoms of withdrawal. And so tethered to an understanding of the term addiction implies that there is a physiologic dependence that occurs. So if I give you a prescription for morphine because you have a gunshot wound and you take it every day, I'm causing you to become physiologically dependent on the medication. If I stop the medicine suddenly, you'll go through withdrawal just like a heroin addict that can't get heroin. The concept even then, well, oh, well, hold on, doctor. If you gave morphine for a person in pain, um, they just fall asleep. They're not getting high, right? The, that, that guy on the street who's shooting dope, he's getting high. Yeah, you'd be wrong. My patient's getting high. But when you're in extreme pain and I give you pain relief, you're going to fall asleep because your body is desperate for some rest. So you won't be awake for most of your intoxication. On the other hand, for those that have gotten, some meds are more euphorogenic than others, and, and the medical pharmacopoeia not on the street, I'd say anybody who's had um, um, Darvacet, um, it's pretty common that people will say, I feel really happy with this stuff. Maybe you shouldn't give that to me again. And so there's this little notion of, of addiction even in that, and everybody will experience that. But if you wind up taking this every day, then you can go, like my patient who needs to be on morphine for after a gunshot wound, you'll go into withdrawal. And so now you need the, to keep buying more of the substance and taking it every day to just feel normal. And it's the corruption of this medical condition into a, um, into a, a legal one, into a justice one, because like if we can just leave, you know, legislate away from this and, and imprison people, that we can and say that we're doing something about this problem, that as animals we can get in pain and we need a pain medication. So, um, but but that's not going to stop, right? <laughs> so, the point about the about the talking about the medicine of it is that it can happen to every single one of us because all of us can experience pain. But once it's happened and you become dependent on it, our society is particularly cruel in how we manage this issue. I don't want to see whatever we're doing public policy-wise denying pain relief to those that need it. We're not supposed to be legislating on the backs of our patients, and we're back to doing that again. And we got into the current cycle of mess with OxyContin and everything, because as a society we got fed up with having pain under treatment. 
So we need to have a proper discussion like these to, to understand what is that healthy balance because um, if you just can keep thinking that we can incarcerate people, but those are um, our fathers or mothers or brothers or sisters or children, our friends, there's somebody, there's somebody that you know, is cared for and loved for by somebody else. And no matter how our society debases them, there's still somebody. And that's the beginning of recovery. It's not through demanding 12-step um, AA forever and NA, although I love NA and AA and they do great jobs, but think about it from, as a scientific perspective, there's also self-selection bias. It works for those that keep returning and those that don't. Well, some of those are my patients, what am I supposed to do? Tell them, well, you didn't do AA, so I'm not gonna help you either. I don't have that um, um, uh, luxury to be wedded to just one dogma when we're talking about somebody's life is entrusted in your hands. So, oh, I'm just saying, just to finish up, so the yep. point is that, is that when, you take an, when you take heroin as an addiction of substance, it's no different than morphine. It just comes on faster. So fentanyl on the street, everybody's upset, and they should be, because it's killing a lot of people. But um, it's the same thing. It, it'll get people high, but it'll take care of the pain. And until we get these types of drugs out of the pharmacopoeia, um, it, this problem is going to continue to grow a lot. And it, it's in epidemic proportions right now. So I think that's a good stuff. Yeah. Uh, one, one of the other quotes that John gave me early on, I think it's when, when you said it, and I'll misquote it, but it's from, what, his name's Robert Wakefield in Traffic, in the, the film Traffic. Yeah. Can you do it better than me? But if you're going to do a war on drugs, then you're going to wage a war on your family. And how can you wage a war on your own family? Right? Which is another good one. Uh, one thing I've realized, and I think what I said before, I actually think people have all kinds of opinions, but I think this area, even in the few years since we wrote the book, or since we started the book, is doing a lot of stuff right um, and trying to do other stuff right that they're not able to yet. Police department, social services, groundworks, the hospital, uh, turning point, Morningside, you know, people get it. They get what needs to be done in a lot of cases. The problem, the biggest problem is at the 30,000 foot level and they do not get it. I mean, more and more, um, it's funny, in uh, last year, I think Congress and Trump approved $8 billion, that's like a lot of money for opium, for dealing with the opium crisis. Uh, 70,000 people die a year. The same year, Congress allocated $120 billion for disaster relief. Now, I don't think that we shouldn't give money to people who lose their homes and stuff, but 70,000 people dying a year is a disaster. Uh, and uh, they're not serious about it. Even, and I meant to look up all the candidates' positions before coming, but I know that Elizabeth Warren proposed $100 billion over 10 years. And I thought, wow, $100 billion over 10 years, it's $8 billion a year. It's the same thing Trump got done. It's very, very hard. Uh, I mean, the candidates' positions are very good, but one said that they want to make sure that there's addiction treatment in every county or city or town in the country within four years. If I said to you there was going to be you know, a defibrillator or whatever cardiac treatment, in that amount of time, you know, you'd laugh at me. What do you mean we have to wait four years? It's nuts. Uh, John, tell about, one of the questions is decriminalization, which to me is the first step, and you can't decriminalize until you have a system for people to come into. But could you talk about the uh, Portuguese experiment and what it might look like here? Because we all say we want decriminalization. Well, but also just remember, America has a long tradition of enacting policies that are incompletely right. uh, implemented. Even the federal law that says that every community has, has to have a telephone line brought to it. Um, in some of my years on Navajo Nation, they're still waiting almost 100 years later for that, for that uh, promise to be fulfilled. So in the Portuguese model, which is expanded to other nations of Europe as well, um, basically they said, you know, Let's take out the criminal element from the personal user, no matter what the drug is, hard or soft. This is immaterial. It's um, what we do care about are, are the people that are citizens. So we're not going to imprison them anymore. We're not going to give them any sort of um, uh, legal consequences. 
They can be arrested for things like disorderly conduct and other things, and that may present them to a judge who may, um, um, as part of their sentence, encourage them to get treatment. And if they keep getting rearrested, it becomes a little bit more onerous and more prison-like in the treatment, but no more of devoting uh, police dollars to incarceration of its citizenry. And <clears throat> um, they have a lower rate of drug abuse amongst their youth and in the general population than we do, and they have a much lower incarceration rate, and they have a lower rate of overdose than we have. 2% two, uh, 2 of yeah. America is 10% of Britain's. 2% of the overdose rate. It would be like 1,400 people a year in America instead of 70,000. So if you are, uh, I don't know if this is really a conservative liberal issue, but if you are, uh, let's say, the draconian drug warrior variety, that the, the, I don't want to see anything legalized, I don't want to see anything decriminalized, and leave it with, to tobacco and alcohol, those are the only two vices, and that's it. Um, literally, what I'm presenting to you is that just the statistical data from a public health standpoint that these policies of decriminalization to legalization lead to a lower rate of drug abuse than the model in which everything is kept illicit and illegal like we have now. I mean, a drug, John has an interesting rap about drug courts, which is another one of these things that I thought, oh, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> I don't like drug courts. To me, it's a human rights crime. That's right. We, well, why are we having judges and prosecutors playing doctor? It's offensive to me. It's, it's wrong. It's unethical. It's, it's absolutely a bastardization of the criminal justice system and of care. We don't need judges and prosecutors holding a gun to the head of, a, of somebody who's resisting treatment or dangling the benefit of a lower sentence if they accept treatment. And then I have to have in a group where I have people who really want to get help, and then all of a sudden there's a court-ordered person that doesn't want to be there, and he's encouraging people to relapse. It's a mess at every step of it. I understand it can save lives, and that's important. I love that. In our system, maybe drug courts are, are necessary because um, um, the senator, former Senator Warren Rudman said to me, I, you got to stop talking like this, Halpern. You know, you, there's only, you know, if we want to get reelected, politicians, you know, we need doctors to, and public policy will stick their necks up for us, for us to do anything different. Because it's, for us, a binary equation. Either tough on crime or soft on crime. Pick. Tougher crime or soft on crime. And I'm like, no, 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 we have to decriminalize everything. He goes, ah. See, you're just trying to be smart on crime. I didn't give you that choice. <laughs> but that's what we got to do. Uh, one of the other 30,000 foot issues that uh, the country is pretty duplicitous about, or the 30,000 foot people are, is the issue of uh, insurance parity and addiction treatment. And uh, the more I read about this, the more nonsense it seems. Back in as early as Kennedy, uh, J uh, JFK, we started moving towards a community me mental health care model that was funded by the federal government. So you'd have equal, you, you know, you'd have to get a different treatment if you moved from, you know, Rhode Island to Vermont. Uh, but what happened is the Vietnam War came and the money that was supposed to go to keep moving that uh, thing forward went to Vietnam where of course we, <laughs> we got a lot of soldiers addicted to heroin. Uh, then Jimmy Carter kind of re-brought uh, that back into the fore and just a quick story, when he was running for uh, governor, his wife Rosalind was out campaigning with him, I don't know, it must have been the early 70s. and. This one woman came up and shook her hand and said, I'm sorry, I have to go. She said, oh, you know, what's the hurry, whatever. She said, I have to get home to take over for my mentally uh, ill son with a mental illness so my husband can go to work. The next day, Rosalind got in the line of people shaking Jimmy Carter's hands, and he gets his wife in front of him. And uh, he said, what are you doing here? She said, I want to know what you're going to do about the mental health crisis in America. I like that story. Uh, <laughs> But then Reagan came along. So, you know, Carter got us back on track. Reagan came along and came up with this idea called community block grants, which sounds like a really good idea in the abstract, states, community level. You do, you give them the money, they know what's best. But the problem is you've got 
underfunding, first of all, it managed to reduce the funding by a third of what it cost. If it cost the government a third less to do block grants than when they were funding the whole thing. And you get this disparities between different, different states and different counties and you know this mishmash of laws. I was sitting, and this is a little later, but I was sitting with a couple of therapists that probably people know at Amy's downtown, and, and we started where's Josh? We, we started this whole discussion of would Medicaid or Medi- Medicaid pay to get a ride to a treatment facility, <coughs> depending on how many miles away you were from that treatment facility. You know, I mean, it's just, we didn't get it. I've written about it. They deal with it every day. So one of the, uh, is, we talk a lot about mental health parity. Again, it's nuts to have someone have to leave a hospital, addiction treatment center after 28 days. They would never kick out a cancer patient after 28 days. It's, you know, the more you look at it, it's just treated so differently. We say, well, it's different. This is causing, you know, because of the overdose, a different issue. 130,000 people die of lung cancer every year. So 70,000 die of overdose as well. These are equal situations, and they should be funded, and they should, the insurance should be equal. And one of the most insidious uh, complications of this that I hadn't thought of is the fact that uh, the poor psychiatric doctors, uh, that it, they, they uh, reimburse lower. And I think, actually, to get a psychiatric degree costs longer than a med degree. It's an additional... Well, it's your... And, and anyway, so if it's reimbursed it's a less, it's a so residency. Yeah, I don't know how this stuff works. <laughs> but it's expensive, and they get reimbursed less. So few people, that's why we have these treatment deserts where there's no treatment for 100 miles, and there's not enough even when there is some. Just the thing about, quickly about this thing of like not talking about it. I'm used to this becoming a, a subject of interest all around national elections, and then it goes away. But with fentanyl, where we now don't have to have the substance grown, First time in human history. That's one of the things that's really important, I think, in the book, is explaining that how opium has followed the course of so, the development of civilization, but it's in our lifetime that that cycle has been broken into something worse. Because where it used to be, you can't stop growing the opium poppy because one poppy flower contains 20,000 seeds. And you can replant and re- restart from just one flower you know, on a commercial level. But now it's all synthetic, and it's where heroin's a thousand times stronger than morphine, and fentanyl is a thousand times stronger than that. And it's cheap to make. Twenty thousand dollars of chemicals gets you two million, roughly, on the street. It's everywhere. But we grew up in a time where, like, you know, like Susan Sontag's illnesses metaphor. This this era where we don't talk about cancer. You know, nobody remembers that. It's like that with, with, with substance abuse. But finally, since it became a, it kind of hit everybody at the same time in, as the last presidential cycle, that we have more people dying every year, roughly in one year, from, uh, from overdoses than the entire Vietnam War. 70,000 Americans were at a, an epidemic level. At least the story has remained, because it used to be people got comfortable to think, well, let's just not talk about it. Let's pretend that it's not, it doesn't exist and maybe it'll go away. And you know, let's make it even harder. Let's make it so that there's even less services and then there'll be less of a problem. And of course, I'm thinking especially of you dear Vermonters with that <laughs> statement. I'm referring to the fact that Vermont was the only state to not allow methadone to be prescribed forever, pretty much. By, by, doc, by any doctor, you mean? Yeah, no methadone clinic was. Allowed. We have a we have now. It's now, different. Okay. No, now it's different. Okay, but forever until like the last I think it was about fifteen years ago right. it changed. There was no methadone in Vermont, as if that would keep the problem from going away. So one of, one of my concerns to hear about, and, and I talk to uh, people at the retreat about it because I don't understand it. Maybe someone can explain it to me. We have Habit Opco, which has a contract to do, I get confused, methadone treatment, whereas you have to go to the retreat to get uh, uh, Suboxone, which one's right in some situations, others best in other situations. It's up to a doctor to figure that out. Well, where's the gatekeeper? Who's walking in what door? You know, how, I mean, you talk to people who are struggling with addiction, it's like they've heard of Habit Opco, so they go there, they heard of the Who's deciding at the retreat, no, you should go up to Habit Opco? 
I'm not hearing that. I mean, this, people here might know more about that. But, but your point is, 2018 to not, I mean, in 2019, okay, 2020, you'd think that there'd be all, all this would be decided by, for medical reasons. Right. The, there is not one legitimate medical argument in support of making methadone for addiction or opiate addiction available only through a methadone clinic. I can prescribe methadone to my patients for pain, but I can't use it for opiate dependence. I can give Suboxone in an office space, but I can't give methadone. Why? Not for any medical reason. So why it, do you think? for the very reasons that there was organized beginning is this idea of not in my backyard. That we're gonna have these discrete areas that the police can point to and we're not gonna, the, the, this constant claim, just like we saw starting in the 1980s, especially the screaming against um, needle replacement, that we're going to encourage more addiction by making um, you know, clean needles available to those that are abusing drugs. We're going to make it as dangerous as possible. We're going to try to kill as many Americans as possible. And that that is going to be the way that we're going to deal with substance abuse. So it's, it's, it's for that reason. It's to punish the addict. They are the victims of the drug war also. Right? Oh, and they the are the loved too. Safe injection sites. Could you talk about yeah. them? So, so um, most people I think have heard of them, but I didn't, I, when John told me about them, Two or three years ago, I said, what? It's the most counterintuitive thing I thought I'd ever heard. So there's two varieties. Um, the more American palatable one, which exists in, in some cities a little bit, like Philadelphia, but basically um, letting people um, without harassment come in and inject what they, what they have. If they're overdosed, there's staff there to get them medical attention right away. And, um, giving them clean needles, doing things like helping review their health care. You know, why do people with heroin addiction have such bad teeth? Does the drug destroy their teeth? No. The addiction destroys their teeth. They stop brushing their teeth. And that's why they have such bad dentition. So they're coming in, they can get reminders that they need to get dental work done. Or how about some people, what they do is they keep injecting through their, in their favorite spot, and eventually it builds up something called a stoma, tissue that comes up and they can eat, it's like its own little hep port and you can inject into. Well, that causes turbulence in blood flow that can cause the development of a bacterial infection of your heart and kill you. So how about just telling someone who's not willing to quit just yet, please do not keep injecting your stuff through that spot. And then once you start saying we care about you like this to help you, they'll think about it. I mean, and these people will start asking for services and when they are ready to give up, when they are ready to, to get treatment, then, then they get helped, and it works. It works. The next level is, the, that blew your top, is heroin replacement, making heroin available to the worst of the worst. So a uh, great friend and uh, close colleague of mine, uh, Torsten uh, Passy at Hanover Medical School, when I was at Harvard Medical School, the 2 H um, he helped start the um, heroin replacement program of Germany so they give heroin to the worst of the worst. Government purchased heroin, uh, diacetyl morphine, and, the, and then the person can use it, uh, can go to the clinic two to three times and inject it in front of them, however they'd like to do it. And everything like I've described before, basically the same. And then these people also are, also eventually, a lot of them go for services. And of course, if they overdose, there's, there's staff and people to help them right away. Now, of course, as you would imagine, the cops were up in arms over this when it started. And there's a huge, huge you know, protest about it. Now, mostly the police forces fight over getting one of these clinics open. Why? Well, um, looking at a two kilometer radius around those clinics, petty crime went down 80%. And for business owners, for property holders, that actually resonated with those that have something to lose. Um, to the people that have nothing and want to take it from you to monetize into their veins. So um, heroin replacement actually um, uh, was put in a head-to-head -head study versus methadone and suboxone, okay? Published in the most, the, currently the best journal on addiction research, addiction, large study. Heroin addicts 
had, um, that were getting heroin, um, had the highest rate of family reunification, employment, having a bank account with money in it, and being employed. Love it. Okay. I want to get back close to that. A couple other uh, harm reduction things we should talk about. One, one goes back to Portugal. There they'll go to rock concerts or concerts and uh, provide free batch testing. So you can go up to the truck and say, you know, I got this. And again, it's counterintuitive because, but it saves lives. So let's talk about harm reduction. You go up to the truck and say, I got this stuff and they test it. Now, I meant to bring it tonight, my fentanyl test kit. Uh, but, you know, that's becoming more available on a retail level, which is a funny word to use. Uh, but John, talk a little bit about fentanyl and, method, uh, and methamphetamine and where we're going with drugs in America. Well, um, I mean, the fentanyl thing is, it, again, was developed with the hope that this would reduce abuse because we have something more potent. And it's astonishing to see how it has gone onto the street. It really has changed the truth. I mean, the opiate addiction in our country. And um, I th and, and it's, it is impossible to ignore, like before. Anybody out there who thinks that it's not going to touch them, it, it has. You just don't know it yet. It's that endemic. Um, our book starts off with a story about the loss of a colleague of mine, my best friends who hit his opiate addiction from me and everybody else and killed himself. So, um, and he was working in Indian Health Service. So there's a lot of Native people who don't have a physician anymore as well. So it even indirectly affects people. Um, the future with fentanyl is bad. And, it, and, the, and I'm very scared that it's becoming a political talking point. It's become another topic of the bash China. Everybody knows, ooh, fentanyl's coming from China. Fentanyl's coming from China. Hello, do you think these major narco traffickers are giving it up? How they're actually doing it in the United States? No, it becomes a talking point about China. It's homegrown. Again, twenty thousand dollars of chemicals, none of which are on French watch. I mean, on the Schedule One list. Same son of. Uh, French watch list. So if you get busted with it, it's just a couple of years in prison. Ship it to the city that you want to distribute in. Synthesize just enough, or what, just for the city. Just get it done, and 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 you've totally cut out the cycle. Um, major issues with trafficking and and the growth cycle of the opium poppy. And there are. DEA has found about 16 different fentanyl analogs in the last couple of years. There's hundreds, though. Car fentanyl killed an extra thousand people in just one year in Ohio. Again, that's a, that's 10,000 times stronger than than morphine. Um, and there's stuff more potent than that. So I'd say the future is bleak for opiates, and it's the problem is going to continue to get worse until we truly, truly get ourselves out of the need to use opiates altogether from the pharmacopoeia. And that's a message of hope. I, I can't talk more about that. For methamphetamine, it's coming east. It's slowly, everybody that's interested in, in, in drug policy has been talking about this. The resistance against it is it lasts longer. If you stay on cocaine, the person has to keep being a repeat purchaser. Oh, it, but to make the cocaine actually, to extract even more profit from it, I have to tell everybody that I see that, that just told me that they're abusing cocaine, that they have to have a Narcan on them now because they're spiking fentanyl into the cocaine. People who don't even know that they're getting an opiate, don't want opiates, they're getting hooked on it and think it's special cocaine. And there's people who've overdosed them from fentanyl in their cocaine. So that's I like calling John, he always tells me these pretty stories. This, is, this also was new to me when yeah, he told about six dangerous. months ago. And then, the methamphetamine, it's cheap to make, it's easy to make. Uh, if you go online and you just search about metha, you know, methamphetamine bus, it, it, it's astonishing the, the cross-section of Americans who decide to become their own little mini drug dealer, drug manufacturer. I, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've read articles about 
uh, a Catholic priest who got busted. As a, I mean, that's a new law. Um, <laughs> as, as a meth uh, manufacturer, a lawyer, I've, read a, I've, I've found a case of a judge who was doing this. Uh, I, I mean, every sing, everybody has gone into that act. And again, very hard to detect, very profitable very quickly and highly, highly addictive. I mean, the person wants to continue to use when it's wearing off, and that's how people get separated from most of their money. The other thing about that is there's no suboxone methadone for uh, there's no there's no easy way off. Thing, there's right? one medication. Oh, there is uh, Vig Vigabatrin, uh, which has NIDA, some NIDA funding. It's approved for childhood seizures. Has good data showing that it decreases relapse to methamphetamine. But the side effect is uh, visual field deficits. It will cause blindness. But if you don't mind the risk of you could go partially blind. We got one medication in the works. That brings us to what I really love. Let's see John talk about, which is what's out there. <laughs> Let's end it on a hopeful note. What's, uh, what's out there? What aren't we? There, there's sort of two parallel things. What's hopeful in terms of basic pharmaceuticals? And what are the things that we've ignored because like LSD or these other drugs that could have been really helpful? And what are the alternatives uh, like the frog peptides or whatever you keep on talking to me about? Yeah. Thanks. So, you know, uh, okay, a lot of the science uh, that's reviewed in our book shows that it led to worsening addiction, actually. So I've got to be careful here, pumping up with the latest and greatest, because maybe it, it, the underbelly of it is something worse also. Um, but that being said, um, um, there, I am excited about the, uh, uh, heavy molecular weight compounds that drive from proteins that are peptides, pe uh, amino acid chains that are peptides. And there are venoms extracted from mollusks, from some arachnids, from amphibians, and including frogs, um, that show important um, medicinal properties to them. And this is a very active area of research for the last um, 20, 30 years, yes, with the United States leading that research, famous by John Daly at uh, NIH in the early 70s, getting funded from, from our tax dollars that led to this now. And, um, and now, importantly, being led by a guy named Chris Shaw in, in, in Ireland. So he's identified uh, from some of these frog venoms um, nine peptides that show picomolar affinity for the mu opioid receptor. And at least, you know, it has, it, it, it's, there's a lot of drug development I have, but if it holds, it would suggest that it's possible to achieve a medication that would be fully effective with no tolerance, risk of overdose, risk of withdrawal. And that's when we go goodbye to all the opiates. We don't need them anymore. And then it'll just take time. It'll take time to change. That's, that's my huge hope. The other big, big one is sublocade. A once a month injection of Suboxone. And that way we don't have this monetizing of the medications to treat addiction back into just getting more dope. And people starting and stopping. Uh, and instead they are durably on it. And we know this is like the, in, when you want to give up smoking cigarettes, if you smoke even one cigarette in the first three weeks, you're gonna relapse within the first three months. That is actually true. And it's also true with, um, with the, the other drugs of abuse. So if we have a drug that can inoculate a person from getting high, so when their resolve weakens on, at some moments and they want to relapse, but the Suboxone is still working on them for the whole month, they'll wind up coming back in and getting the next shot, we hope. So that is, I mean, it, this is huge stuff. But let's remember, it's also human nature to, to, to still want to go around that and, and use. So on antabuse for alcoholism, it could kill you if you drank on antabuse. And when you, so you go, I want to stop antabuse so I can drink again. You have to wait two weeks till it's safe to drink again. Two whole weeks to look at that bottle saying that I know if I drink, I'm going to relapse, I'm going to be an addict again. Why don't I just take the, why does my teacher just take the antabuse again? And most of them do, but some don't. Well, that's just true with that. It's absolutely true with, with uh, opiate addiction as well. People can knowingly choose to do the wrong thing. 
you know, something I'd like to call seemingly irrelevant decision making. You just give yourself just enough plausible deniability. Oh, I didn't, it didn't mean to happen or time just sped up. But what we really need is to just encourage people to feel open enough to talk about these problems, that they are somebody. That's what's exciting too, is that this type of conversation, the, the timing for our book turned out to be pretty good because the message of, 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 of let's get this discussion going so we can save more lives is desperately needed now. We didn't know that when, when he and I just started out on this, but it really would kind of crystallize to the nation has this interest and attention now to learn something here. Because if we, if we just go back to the way it was, of waiting for law enforcement to take care of this problem, we're just gonna have more people in prison and more people dead. And the problem is just gonna keep churning so they'll have more people to go in prison. So we've gone on for a while. I have trouble seeing, but do people have questions? Because we can go on forever. Yes? I have, I have a question. So I appreciated, John, you talking at first about pain, but there's soul pain and there's physical pain. And to think of what lies behind the addiction. What's the co what leads to the addiction? What is the pain they're trying to avoid or not even know how to deal with. And it seems like it's just a barometer, a reflection of our society, a reflection of the crazy life we're living in our children who are medicated so early and Ritalin and threshold drug and so on and so on. I mean, it's a huge issue. Thank you for the comment. Um, but remember, these opiates are also in our brain. Um, I did a horrible experiment on a friend once. I um, dried out uh, habanero peppers and I pulverized it into a dust. And then I took a Q-tip and dipped it in some olive oil. And then I took the two Q-tips and I shoved them in his nostrils. And then batted away his hands. Are you in so college? I, what was going on? I was somebody who, who used to have a, a, an opiate problem. And I was curious about this. So, batted away his hands from it. He turned beet red, his eyes and he started, you know, making strange sounds until he kind of like forcefully shoved me away, ripping these things out of his nostrils, screaming, that's so painful. And then he proceeded to vomit and had dilated pupils and was stunned from the opiates being released, the endorphins and the encephalins in the brain from the pain that I induced. Opiates are in us anyway. Um, you know, you mentioned Ritalin. That's, that's a loaded term because say, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is both an overdiagnosed and underdiagnosed disorder. Many inner city kids who do the criteria for it don't wind up getting that care, get mislabeled as be, being uh, a conduct disorder and go into the juvenile justice system. And then you've got some other people that think that, you know, parking your kid in front of the TV to watch somebody hiking on the Discovery Channel. Well, that, I'm sorry, that's not the same thing as hiking in the forest with your kid. So maybe ADHD for those people is more like I like calling it NDHD, Nature Deficiency Hyperactivity Disorder. Um, but this whole thing about soul pain and physical pain, your brain is a physical object, so your soul pain is physical pain also, is what I'd say about that. And um, and, if you, and it's very blurry. People living with chronic pain have, um, over time, brain shrinkage. There's atrophy of, of gray matter over time, just living chronically with pain. So your brain changes from living with that and suffering with that. And again, physical pain trans can, tr can go right over into, into emotional pain and vice versa. People who are depressed process physical pain more painful than somebody without depression. So where do we draw the line there? So if somebody has clinical depression and they say that they need to have a much larger dose to treat their pain condition, and the doctor's, oh, you're just being dramatic. But, but there's actually a you know, scientific basis for that, and data that can show that. So very often, we, I think we have to get much better at checking um, very carefully how much of our opinions are being fueled by our own prejudices, assumptions, worries, 
hey, in the absence of fact, you know, fear may reign. We want to protect our kids. But what is it that causes more debilitation rather than, rather than actually doing anything good? I, I, it's a, your question can't be, you know, fully answered. You just have to be meditating because it needs to be addressed. We have to, we have to get more comfortable talking about that. Uh, the book that John and I first wanted to write uh, before they asked us to do this was called Changing Our Minds. And then it turns out Michael Pollan stole the title in the meantime, but um, that, that happens. But the idea is that I don't think, and I'm not, I don't think we need, humans like to change their minds. They like to change their consciousness. And I think it's, I think most beings do, it sounds like. I mean, they're animals and stuff. But we do, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, we do it all kinds of ways. In different, in different cultures at different times, some ways are proved of, some ways aren't. I mean, one of our big problems now with adolescence is we don't, and we've talked about this for a while, there are no, not none, there aren't very many healthy adult-guided initiation rituals. Well, a lot of indigenous cultures involve hallucinogens, involve extreme uh, uh, pain, right? And so that's a big issue, but the, some kids need initiation one way, some kids need initiation the other way. And clearly, there's no one size fits all, there's no magic bullet. I think that, uh, you know, we spent, I, I, you know, we were afraid of uh, nuclear weapons. These kids are overwhelmed with impressions. We're overwhelmed with impressions, and we're supposed to be smart enough not to be. So I think that we have to realize that the human is evolving. The drugs in some way evolve to meet the human for both better and for ill. So, I mean, it's a tough question, because as you know, we, we ultimately we want to help the whole person. I mean. We know that. But when you're a teacher with 35 kids in the room and the kids are bouncing off the wall and you can't get their attention, uh, you're saying, you know, can you guys go get a prescription for Adderall? It'll make my life easier. And you can't blame them in some ways. Any other questions? Oh, make the hand. Um, I just want to um, add to what Dr. Halpern said relative to the physical versus pain in the soul. I think the commonality is the search for uh, quick action relief. And I think when you're, when you're in that paradigm of how fast can my pain be relieved, there is no difference also. It's just quick damage. Um, and that's it. Um, my question to the two of you is, um, I like your point of view on how the elasticized definition of addiction has impacted the treatment paradigms. And what? Um, elasticized, elasticized. Elasticized definition of addiction. And the politic and how this become politicized also. Yeah, yeah. yeah well I talked to, touched on it a little bit. Yeah. You, you know, with drug court. Um, it it's taken on um, the the gullum. You know, the Omega Man. This is the person to, again, target and be ostracized from. Just this long tradition of doing this. The crack epidemic led to all these extra um, uh, long sentences, but it's no more dangerous than powder cocaine. But who was using crack cocaine the most? People in inner cities, minorities. And so they wound up getting incarcerated away. Um, when MDMA ecstasy legislation started with a lot, again, with the government creating a lot of crazy fears over, over, over dramatizing the, the risks of the drug and so just factually doing it. And sadly, that included um, um, Joe Biden doing that. He wrote the anti rave Act, a really horrible piece of law. Um, it said, what am I referring to? It, it, in that law, it said that um, if you have a cool down room offering water and quiet environment for somebody who's been dancing, you know, whatever, then, then that's no different than a crack den and you guys should go to jail. So again, he's anti-harm reduction back then. Um, but we knew back then that crack cocaine was any more dangerous. So There's a huge JAMA article, Journal of American Medical Association about it. It didn't make much of an impact. Because, because what sold was that we were doing something about 
But is it, in, in, the, in the 1970s and 1980s, that was not considered an addicting drug because it didn't meet the criteria for addiction. No, in, in, um, that, that's where I'm going. Okay, so in, in, the, ni in the 1980s for sure, um, I would say, uh, and in the 1970s, we understood that addiction requires um, tolerance, the building up of tolerance that's and withdrawal. And that, and that stayed, has stayed pretty, pretty good. What's the big, the big shift public policy-wise around this debate, the philosophical debate of this, happened um, with the giving up of the Federal uh, Bureau of Narcotics with the treatment. There used to be these federal prisons if you were an incorrigible drug abuser, and you'd get sent to these club feds for up to two or three years. And it was President Johnson who stopped that. I mean, up until, it wasn't until 1960, you know, 50 years ago, 68, 69, 70, that we finally came up with to accept that um, alcoholism is a disease. Before this, was a concept of the happy-go-lucky lush. And, or, or even, to go even earlier, there was the era when there weren't all these laws, there was more tolerance for even the happy-go-lucky lush, you know? Like W.C. Fields made a whole career out of Staying depressed and alcoholic. Um, I did like his joke of, I, I like the taste of all drink except for water. Um, and of course, I'd rather be buried here than, than to be in Philadelphia. Um, but um, but the, the happy go lucky lush thing did a lot of damage. Where you, if you show me somebody who, is a, who has chronic alcoholism, I'm showing you somebody with severe depression. The drug itself causes depression, and very often it is people with major depressive disorder develop these dual diagnoses, and they develop an addiction. If I had a quarter or a nickel for every person who meets criteria for chronic paranoid schizophrenia and says to me, oh, it was the LSD I did. This is all LSD. But no, it's not. LSD does not cause a chronic psychiatric condition. It won't do that. I mean, I'm asking. So to ask you a question about yeah, I'm not sure we have. Have we asked the, the policy yet? definition of expanding from the 70s, 80s, it's, it's better and it's worse. We have much more accountability because of the internet and because of, I think, the rigorous work being done at the National Institute on drug abuse, not of drug abuse. Um, But then you get somebody who feels very strongly about it and argues it from a religious perspective and a moral one and it doesn't want to hear anything about the, the medical side of the equation. And we have powerful protections of religious liberty here and so suddenly kind of fruit loopian beliefs um, get thrown into the mix. Maybe you mean that. For example, Scientologists believe that you should just go through, sit in a sauna and the sauna, extensive sweating, will, will help treat your addiction. And God forbid you see a human rights criminal like a psychiatrist. Don't do that. Or take our meds. <laughs> Again, did, did we answer at all? Yeah. I'm going to tell one thing just to follow up because we, we didn't do it justice. Uh, the racial implications of, of drug enforcement, uh, we could spend a whole thing on. I'll just say quickly, it started with the Chinese. Uh, in coming into San Francisco to work the railroads. P uh, America twisted itself in knots so they can let Victorian men and women still do their, their, uh, their meds. And while the Chinese were bad, ugly people uh, that were doing this nasty thing and corrupting our, our young people. And then the famous one, which is a pretty well known book, Chasing the Scream, where uh, uh, Harry Anslinger, who started the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, uh, was trying to get uh, Judy Garland into treatment because she was a fine young woman who had gone bad at the same time he was having uh, Billie Holiday chained to her, uh, arrested and handcuffed to her hospital bed and she was dying of uh, kidney failure or something, whatever, uh, from her addiction. So that's the thing that John's talking about, the incarceration rates. It's a whole other story. It's, it's pretty shameful. Yes, question. Um, I have a question. Well, in, in um, reading and watching videos of Gabor Mate, Mm -hmm. which does work in Canada. Um, I think he really addresses the role of empathy in um, empathy and the lack of it in addiction and in recovery. And I was wondering if you have anything to say about that. I don't know. So you yeah. yeah. So um, um, 
I really like that he has made it more comfortable to talk about using non-ordinary states of reality as a therapeutic state too, right? So there's somebody who's, uh, who recommends, well, to try, uh, to try psychedelics, basically. And um, there may be some merit to, to that. Um, uh, it's something I studied for a very long time at Harvard, and, and I still believe that there's something there. Um, I think that's the heart of the matter. We have a major failure in public policy right now that we just say that it's 12 step programs for everybody. It's woven into the legal system. The laws of Vermont include encouraging people to go to 12 step programs. But what are you supposed to do? Staying sober. I mean, I have patients that have been sober for 20 years and through AA and NA. And they're paying it forward, sponsoring people to help. And I think that's wonderful, and it helps them. But if you're just gonna put it that you have to keep going to, it's like fight clubs, and you keep going to meetings forever and ever and ever, like that's supposed to get us somewhere. It doesn't, and it won't. What really matters is to nurture a sense of self. Even if nobody cares about you, you're still somebody. And that's where the recovery starts. So that's where it resonates to me. I mean, if you really want somebody to change, um, that's where it has to begin. I had a patient who, um, uh, for 10 years, was shooting heroin and really never got clean. I said to her, never, it was in a detox. And she said, well, I'd come in, I start getting better, and then I get flooded with memories of being raped and abuse and how I make a living, and I can't handle that. So I figured, I, I can make this go away right away. I just go out and get high. I don't have to think about her face it again, and I can definitely earn the money. And so I leave. So I've never completed detox in 10 years. And um, I had this idea of using Zyprexa, an antipsychotic for, um, for schizophrenia. It's also proof for uh, true refractory depression and bipolar disorder. Well, it's a dopamine blocker. Hmm. So could that maybe upend um, how we process um, craving? The dopamine theory of the final common theory of addiction because the dopamine drives pleasure. So if we can block it, maybe we can cut it off. So I gave her dopamine, uh, you know, Zyprexa, started sleeping better, and three days later, she, she wasn't shivering, um, just in fear with people coming around. And I asked her, you know, what's going on? She's like, I'm not having any cravings. I said, really? So I think it's almost a placebo effect if I didn't know your story. <laughs> and she looked at me and she says, Doctor, you spent 90 minutes with me. You know my story. There's no placebo effect with me. She completed the program. She completed detox and completed a 30-day program. And while I would love to think that the program is that great, there ain't no way anybody providing those services that of all of us were doing really turned the trick. So sometimes it is the medicine is my point to get things started, it can really make a difference. I don't believe we have to have, for example, somebody be um, motivated for treatment. They can be kind of resistant even. I can accept that, that they're on the fence whether they really think they need to do something about this or not. We don't have to have them begging us for treatment for it to start, for the conversation to start. And the real thing is to the sanctity of life. You respect life, you encourage life, you get people to recognize what they're doing to themselves, that they find that it's harming their own sense of dignity, then we've got a place to start. I want a very quick example. The one thing I want, I want to have a Surgeon General's warning on a pack of cigarettes that doesn't exist. So if you're a heroin addict and you get somebody coming about smoking cessation, the primary care doctor goes, warning, you know, it may cause lung cancer or a small baby or you can have a heart attack. Those are all things that are on there. Heroin. Give me my smokes. What do I care about that? If I'm going to die before if the, any of that stuff catches up with me, do they continue smoking? What I want to have on a pack of cigarettes says, warning, may worsen anxiety in those with anxiety issues. <laughs> because if you didn't have a problem with anxiety regulation before opiate addiction, you sure do now. 100% of them have anxiety disorders. All of them. And the worst of the worst people often are people that have failed 
treatments for their anxiety disorder. The, 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 his, the childhood histories are just so horrifically bad. The benzos don't even work for them anymore. The therapy was always churning through. They had a new therapist every time and they're being picked on for being an addict and the underlying issue of the abuse that happened that damaged them so deeply never gets worked on so they can you know, go from just surviving to thriving. And that's what makes also being a doctor fun. I don't, I hate people who keep talking about clients. <laughs> Shame, shameful thing. And it's not to be paternalistic to say I'm your doctor, you're my patient. It just means that there's a higher, higher moral covenant before God that we are supposed to do right by you. I don't care about how much money the insurance system is going to cost, it's going to, it's going to cost. If I can get the best what I can for my patient, that's all I want to advocate for. And that's a lot of fun for me personally. And so it's fun being a doctor on that side. I feel so bad for these people that get jaded from this. I work primarily with people with addictions, with major psychiatric issues. I've been doing it for 25 years. I love doing it. I've saved lots of lives doing that. I, and I do it by respecting people. 100% of my patients have my cell phone number. Because if you have a behavioral disorder, it's kind of inconvenient. You're supposed to remember it for the office appointment three weeks later, right? And how about, this strike on the air is hot. Let's deal with it now, let's get it over with. If I don't want to get disturbed after hours, I guess I should have become a stockbroker. <laughs> and that gets things done. And, and, and people in recovery want to feel that somebody cares about them. How about that, this good old fashioned medicine right. could make a big difference. Stop being so fast. <laughs> I thought you had a, yeah, that's, I, I mean, we could stop soon, but. I wanted to say something with reference to the things that you're talking about, about the dual diagnosis and the, the compassion and the giving people a, a sense that they matter. I've been working as a therapist for about 20 years in Brattleboro, and I've worked with many of the, the heroin addicts who come through some of the programs there, and, and mostly they are told to go to 12-step programs, but inevitably, I haven't met a single one who didn't have a really significant trauma history. And it happens to be my specialty. I'm not a lay doc, I'm a, I'm a trauma therapist, and that's the work we do. And I'll encourage them, if 12-step programs work, I'll encourage them to do that, but not without doing attachment work and really talking about the experiences of trauma. And my feeling is, I know, you know, in, in substance abuse programs, they say you can't work on this stuff in the first year, but my feeling is, in the first year, if you're not using, then you're gonna be feeling. And so whatever yes. they can learn and experience through therapy in that first year, if they go back and use again, they'll at least they don't lose that knowledge and they don't lose the connection. And I agree with you. I, people are surprised that I answer calls and give phone calls back at night and on the weekends. You, you can't do this work. It doesn't end. Their experience does not end on the weekend or at night. And so I do call people back. And so it's, it's lovely to hear you talking about the importance of that perspective. Very quickly, some, like, how about this? Sometimes you think of a drug of abuse as just being abuse. They, you know, people aren't using drugs to just get hurt. It's actually doing something. If they only did bad things, nobody would get in trouble with them. So we've got to have a more nuanced understanding. So for example, cannabis has an interesting property when it comes to trauma. You, you stop dreaming if you're, if you're habituated to, to cannabis. And for people who have recurring nightmares, they stop having nightmares. Oh, and it's almost impossible to dissociate while high on cannabis. Yeah. And so all these people that have borderline personality disorder, a lot of them are using cannabis. And then they get told that this is drug abuse. But in fact, it's, they just don't see that they're actually having another tool to regulate their dissociation. Anyone else? Well, oh, we do. Jared? Hi, <laughs> Jared. Go ahead. Oh, well, what hasn't been addressed, and I, I think it's it could be a good cause, is this sense of anime and despair in our economically devastated communities that, that, uh, that leads to this. It's like, what, what do we have to live for? What is there? There's no work, there's no hope. And, uh, you know, yes, the gunshot victim, maybe the root canal patient or something that, that had some drugs administered to them by a doctor, but I, uh, I think the vast majority take it up as an escape. 
I totally agree. And uh, I, I, I totally agree. And, and you know, I, uh, you know, I do some guardian ad litem work in town, and I, I feel lucky that I know some single parents who have gotten clean, and as importantly, more importantly, gotten their kids back. But can you imagine being a single parent with no job? Who's an, I'm a big fan of DCF. I know that won't make me a big fan. I, mean, I think they do a lot of good work for kids who are in trouble, because often because of addiction. But can you imagine being a single parent, no job, you have to get to have it up call in the morning, you have to get some meeting downtown later. I mean, I look at their appointment books. It's a fault. They're full. And this is not a blame on them. It's work. It's so much work. And yet we don't, you know, finally you're something like Great River Housing. We have providing housing, providing uh, meaningful work is absolutely, I think this is what you lead to, it's absolutely part of uh, recovery. You know, you need, you need some reason to live, you need a roof over your head, you need good food to eat. In some cases, you need to learn how to cook. And that's why I kid Josh, I assume Josh is still here. It's like, great, we're building this new building. It should be five times as big, have basketball courts, have apartments or single room only. I mean, this, you're right. Or oh, was that you, Josh? <laughs> I, was that. I, was that. I mean, it's a lot of work. It takes a community to really help an addict. It's not their fault. And when you see someone pull it off, I got a note today from a woman who, who's had a bunch of kids taken away, and she was thanking me for writing the book, thanking us, and uh, she's made it. She's been clean two years. She sees her kids once in a while. She lives at Great River. She has a job. It's the bravest thing I know anyone can do. You know, it's just so, I mean, you know, I was addicted to nicotine for 20 years. It's really hard for three weeks. Multiply it, I'm guessing, by 100 times. And you might have some sense of what it's like to get off this stuff. Anything else? Any others? I wanted to finish just with John reading, uh, I don't know what we call it, the afterward. Which I think is also a new talk with, uh, Siblings, our parents, our extended families, and our 
planets. And thankfully, we don't live in a totalitarian state. Unlike China, we don't send users to re-education camps and give the death penalty to dealers with only the mere shadow of a trial. Unlike Singapore or the Philippines, we don't execute people caught possessing even minimal amounts of drugs for personal use. We are in the midst of a public health emergency. Our patients don't have time for the medical professionals to be intimidated by politicians' opinions about quote-unquote acceptable ways to treat addiction or their endless and disingenuous arguments about how to fund that treatment. No, our patients need us to focus on doing everything we can to help them, regardless of the significant scientific, and philosophical, and personal challenges we face in the process. Not doing so is equivalent to malpractice. Doing nothing, staying silent, is being negligent to our obligation to do some good. Several years ago, I was teaching a class at Harvard Medical School and asked my students whether they wanted to be doctors or healers. Some chose one, some the other. I told them they were all wrong. You need to be both, doctor and healer, empiricist and empath. In the years to come, Research will empower healthcare professionals with radically more potent tools against drug addiction. But that said, our most potent treatment will always be in our hearts. Paul Wise, we've had it every day. Thank you. Thank you.